Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Oh, uh, yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening right here in central New Mexico. I am your host, Grimnir. This is the Grim Leftovers Show, episode 36, right here on August 26, 2019. And boy, baby, it's a hot one today. Let me tell you, uh, not quite 100 degrees. It not, didn't, didn't break over that triple digit marker, but dang, we got close. 97 degrees Fahrenheit right now out there. It might, it, it, this might be the hottest day of the year or at least a tie for the hottest day of the year. Most of our days have not been this warm, but uh, today, today Al Gore's in action out there. He's he's cooking our brains or trying to. Damn bastard. <laughs> anyway, how the hell y'all doing? Welcome to everybody out there in all the various places you may be tuned in to the Grim Leftovers program, and you could be tuned in from many of places, maybe right here on reallibertymedia.com or our other site rlmradio.xyz uh, possibly you've tuned in from freedoms network or real liberty.org welcome to you guys you could be on internet radio tune in.com shoutcast.com many many places uh, possible you just saw the link over there or posted on twitter or or minds.com and click the thing and it opened up in your local your local audio player there on the direct ip link so, uh, wherever you may be, where, however you may be getting here, welcome. But come on over to reallibertymedia.com, or you can do it via rlmradio.xyz, and jump on into the chat. You can also do it with your local IRC clan, but uh, come on in here, and you can talk to all the fine folks that are here this evening, tuned in, listening in, maybe not tuned in, maybe just chatting there in the chat. I don't know. Some people, Some people do that. Some people just hang out in the chat and they never even pay attention to the fact that, yeah, there's live shows going on. <laughs> oh, people, people, people. Anyway, hi and howdy to all the folks here in the chat this uh, evening. We got the barman and myself, of course. And we got Miss Moose, a girl who just finished her first day at a brand new job. We got Mr. Prince, who will be on Thursday night with his buddy Poopster. Doing their new show, The Power Hour. Uh, and we got DC and Asimo. Miss Beth Z, who had a birthday on Friday. She's 29 now. Uh, we got, so that's legal. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> we, got, we got Chelsea Doty and Echelon. We got, oh, that's a backward Vinny. I think that's what that is. It's E N I V. I think that's Vinny going backwards on us spinning in reverse we got miss graham z who's got two more episodes of the rocket chair to do this week and then she will be done at least for a while we don't know for how long maybe forever maybe not we'll see maybe she'll do a different show maybe she won't do any shows maybe she'll just co-host on other shows it's up to her it's, it's her it's her life it's her world miss graham z the lovely grammy we got the Java Doctor and Hansel, a.k.a. J. Dredd. We got the Meester Meister Brow down there in Arizona. Probably hotter there than it is here. Uh, yes, indeed, it's down there by Tucson, man. That's a, that's a hot spot. The Pondergander, the other half of Vinny. The Poopster is here as well. The wonderful Miss Kate with us this evening. Uh, Mr. Romes, uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Romes. Uh, Vanna Whitebot, the... Uh, anti verse version uh, w4 dkv the weather dork bot that tells us about all this wonderful weather we're having out there the phantom uh yeah <laughs> we got anti oh we got anti himself and not only do we have w4 dkv but we got anti we got chaskira and uh, apparently uh, another version of him uh it's cyborg doodle and ensiv we got the frumpster down there hanging out Gooberzilla. Hey, Goobs, how's that going, man? Uh, we got the Gromit and JJ's and Kiss and Matt WJ 2002. 
I don't know if that's when he was born or I don't know. I have no idea. We got Mr. Snick hanging out with us tonight and Bone Sauce, the real Donnie Woo. Yes, indeed, this sock puppet, smart as uh, the holiest Roger. The holiest Roger. There's Beetle got, uh, uh, hooking back on in. Hey, B. And we got the lovely Miss Van Meter also as well, or Donna, if you will. So anyway, let's get right on into it. I got a bunch of stories lined up this evening. I, I See, I'm, I'm getting information here from Ponder Gander there in the chat, and I, I don't know what to make of it, so I'm, I'm just going to gloss over that because that sounds wrong. <laughs> oh, man. So how do you feel? about your almighty dollar. The wonderful Federal Reserve notes that you spend on a daily basis. Uh, spend, some of them, some of you get more than you spend, some of you spend more than you get. Every now and then it works out even, where you spend what you get and nothing more, nothing less. But this dollar, this dollar has been the world's reserve currency for 60 years now, how long has it been? Well, before my time, that's when it started. I don't know. But there's a big, big evil bankster out there named J.P. Morgan. And he says, his company, they believe the dollar could lose its reserve status. Yes, it could no longer be the world's reserve currency if J.P. Morgan was ever correct about anything. Anyway, uh, we've been, we've been, Looking at this, reading this, hearing this is coming for a long, long time. But yet they keep on kicking that can on down the road. Now, I don't know if they're out of road or if they're not, but uh, I'm thinking this is mere speculation by <laughs> J.P. Morgan. Uh, this is posted on Zero Hedge on August or July 24th. Uh, so here we go. Almost eight years ago, we first presented a chart first created by J.P. Morgan's Michael Symbolist, which showed very simple and vividly that reserve currencies just don't last forever. It don't happen. And that is not, uh, and, and that is not, what? That is in the not too distant future. Uh, confusing wording. Anyway, the, the U.S. dollar would also lose its status as the world's most important currency since it's never different. What? Since since it is never different this time. Yes, you always hear, oh, it'll be different this time. But if you look at the uh, reserve currency chart they have here, going back to the year 1400, where Portugal apparently had the world's reserve currency, followed by Spain, the Netherlands, France, Britain, and since Britain uh, in around uh, 19, looks like 1925 or so till now, uh, the U.S. dollar has been has been the big guy on the block. Uh, Britain lasted a pretty good long time, as did Spain. Uh, but uh, the, the dollar, we'll see what happens here. Anyway, the, the, as Semblist put it back in January 2012, I am reminded of the following remark from the late MIT economist Rudiger Dornbusch. Crisis takes a much longer time coming than you think, and it happens much faster than you would have thought. Perhaps it is not coincidence then, when in the light of the growing numbers of mentions of MMT and various other terminal destructive monetary policies that have been proposed to kick uh, kick on the current financial system, they can, what? The financial system, the can, oh, it, <laughs> I'll tell you, man, this guy's got very confusing wording. Okay, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me read that again. The destructive monetary policies that have been proposed to kick on the current financial system, the can, just a little bit longer. <laughs> Oh, man, that the topic of the longevity of reserve currency status is once again becoming all the rage, and none other than J.P. Morgan's private bank ask in this month's investment strategy note whether 
the dollar's exorbitant privilege is coming to an end. So why is JP Morgan, after first creating the iconic chart above, which has since spread virally across all financial corners of the internet, not only worried that the dollar's reserve status may be coming to an end, but in fact goes so far as to state that we believe the dollar could lose its status as the world's dominant currency, which could see it depreciate over the medium term due to structural reasons as well as cyclical impediments. Is the dollar, dollar's exorbitant privilege coming to an end? Well, in brief, um, maybe. (laughs) The U.S. dollar has been the world's uh, dominant reserve currency for almost a century. As such, many investors today would, even outside of the United States, have built and become comfortable with the sizable U.S. dollar overweights in their portfolios. However, we believe the dollar could lose its status as the world's dominant currency uh, due to structural reasons as well as cyclical impediments. As such, diversifying dollar exposure by placing higher weighting on other currencies in developed markets and in Asia. Are they they saying Asia is not a developed market? Anyway, as well as precious metals makes sense today, yesterday and tomorrow, uh, let me just say. This diversification can be achieved with a strategy that maintains the underlying assets in an investment portfolio, but changes the mix of currencies within that portfolio. This is a completely bespoke approach that can be customized, that needs to be customized in an ongoing basis, to meet the unique needs of the individual clients. The rise of the dollar. It's commonly perceived that the U.S. dollar overtook Great Britain's pound as the world's international reserve currency with the signing of the Bretton Woods agreements after World War II. The reality is that the sterling's value was eroded for many decades prior to Bretton Woods. The dollar's rise to international prominence was fueled by the establishment of your lovely little Federal Reserve System. And a little over a century ago, the United States' economic emergence after World War I. The Federal Reserve System aided in the establishment of a more mature capital markets and a nationally coordinated monetary policy. Two important pillars of the reserve currency countries. Being the world's unit of account has given the United States what former French uh, minister Valéry d'Estaing called an exorbitant privilege. Being able to purchase imports and issue debt in its own currency and run persistent deficits seemingly without consequence. The Shifting Center There's nothing to suggest that the dollar dominance should remain in perpetuity. In fact, the dominant international currency has changed many times throughout history, going back thousands of years as the world's economic center shifts. At the end of World War II, the United States accounted for the biggest share of the world's GDP at more than 25%. This number is brought to more than 40% when you include Western European powers. Since then, the main driver of economic growth has shifted eastwards. That's what they say. Towards Asia, at the expense of the U.S. and the West. China is the epicenter of the recent economic shift driven by the country's strong growth and commitment to domestic reforms. Over the last 70 years, China has quadrupled its share of the global GDP to around 20%, roughly the same share as the U.S., and this share is expected to continue to grow in the years ahead. China is no longer just a manufacturer of low-cost goods, 
as a growing share of corporate earnings is coming from high-value-add sectors like technology. Well, they go on talking about the China and the dollar, dollar's declining role already underway, trade wars having long-term consequences, and the like. But just bear in mind, none of these last forever. No reserve currency lasts that long. Uh, 100 years is, is a pretty good stretch, and I don't know that it's actually been 100 years, because it didn't happen right away when... Uh, when the Federal Reserve came into effect. But it started happening at that point. So, uh, just bear all this in mind and uh, prepare yourself, embrace yourself, and uh, be ready for the end of the dollar's dominance globally. Not, I'm not saying the end of the dollar. I mean, these other countries that had reserve currencies and are no longer the reserve currency... Uh, Great Britain, uh, France. Well, if, you know, some of these, some of these wound up going into the euro. France and I think the Netherlands is also on the euro, and Spain and Portugal. But Britain still has their pounds. I, I don't know if France has any francs left or not. I, 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 either way, uh, don't look for the U.S. dollar to go away, but look for it possibly to be highly weakened in the, the near future or currently. I, I mean, it's. <laughs> Do you trust it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> From uh, the economic collapse blog dot com, Michael Snyder on July 18. A bank with forty nine trillion dollars in exposure to derivatives. What? $49 trillion in exposure to derivatives. Yeah, that's not a typo. Is melting down right in front of our eyes. Hooray. Could it be possible we're on the verge of the next Lehman Brothers moment? Deutsche Bank is the most important bank in all of Europe. It has $49 trillion in exposure to derivatives, which are basically nothing. Uh, their their bets, their IOUs, their guesses. Well, we think this is going to happen. We'll 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 invest some money and say that's going to happen, based on what? Eh, nah, eh, just gut feeling. Anyway, and most of, <laughs> most of the largest too big to fail banks in the U.S. have very deep financial connections to Deutsche Bank. In other words, the global financial system simply cannot afford for Deutsche Bank to fail. And right now, it is literally melting down in front of our eyes. For years, Mr. Snyder has been warning, and I've been sharing some of his warnings with you, that this day would come. And even though it has been hit by scandal after scandal, somehow Deutsche Bank was able to survive until now. But after what we have witnessed in recent days, Many now believe that the end is near for Deutsche Bank. On July 7th, they really shook up investors all over the globe when they laid off 18,000 employees and announced that they would be completely exiting the global equities trading business. Yes, they did that. These moves may delay Deutsche Bank's inexorable march into oblivion, but not by much. And as Deutsche Bank collapses, it could take a whole lot of others down with it at the same time. A whole slew of them. According to the Wall Street on Parade site, the bank had $49 trillion in exposure to derivatives at the end of last year. Oh, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> yes, the actual credit risk to Deutsche Bank is much, much lower than the notional value of its derivatives contracts, but we are still ta talking about an obscene amount of exposure. And this is especially true when we consider the state of Deutsche Bank's balance sheet. According to NASDAQ, 
uh, as of the end of last year, the bank had total assets of $1.54 trillion total liabilities. Uh, of uh, <laughs> assets of 1.54 trillion, total liabilities of 1.469 trillion. That's a pretty narrow gap. In other words, there wasn't much equity there at the end of December, and things have deteriorated rapidly since then. In fact, it is being reported that a billion dollars a day is being pulled out of the bank at this point. I know most Americans couldn't really give a crap if Deutsche Bank lives or dies, or at least they don't think they give a crap. But as the New York Post pointed out, the failure of Deutsche Bank could quickly become a major crisis for the entire global financial system. And I say, me, personally, let it burn. Burn it to the ground. <laughs> In particular, some of the largest, quote, too big to fail banks, unquote, in the U.S. are heavily interconnected financially to Deutsche Bank. The following comes from the Wall Street on Parade. We know that Deutsche Bank's derivative tentacles extend into most of the major Wall Street banks. According to a 2016 report from the International Monetary Fund, Deutsche Bank is heavily interconnected financially to J.P. Morgan Chase, who just said that the dollar may lose its reserve currency, uh, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley and Bank of America, as well as other me mega banks in Europe. The IMF concluded that Deutsche Bank posed a greater threat to global financial stability than any other bank as a result of these interconnections. And that was when it's... What the hell are you moving around on me? <laughs> Page just moved on me. I, that, was, that was weird. And, and so I lost my spot. Um... Where was I? Oh, and that was when its market capitalization was tens of billions of dollars larger than it is today. Until these mega banks are broken up, which is seemingly unlikely, until the Fed is replaced by a competent and serious regulator of bank holding companies, which seems unlikely, and until derivatives are restricted. I, I, I've been hoping for that for a while, but uh, no such luck. And at the, uh, those der derivatives are restricted to those that trade on a transparent exchange. The next epic financial crash is just one counterparty blow up away. As long as Mr. Snyder has been doing this, he has been warning his readers to watch the global derivatives market. I've been helping, trying to warn you guys as well on those things because, oh, it's a huge, huge game playing with so much money that just doesn't exist. It, play, it played a starring role during the last financial crisis, huge role. Yeah, all of those creative mortgages were, were done, uh, pack, repackaged, packaged, repackaged, packaged again in various derivatives. Yeah, so it will play a starring role in the next one as well. The fundamental structural problems that were exposed during 2008 and 2009 were never fixed. They didn't even look at it. They, 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 want, they did not want to change that. Their, that game was making too much money for a few people. Not, not going to say too many people, but enough people with enough power uh, based upon the fact of this fake money that, that that was never going to be fixed, at least not at that point. Not that it's not going to come crashing down, though. Uh, yeah. In fact, many would argue that the global financial system is even more vulnerable today. I'd argue that uh, than it was back during that time. And now it appears that the next Lehman Brothers moment may be playing out right in front of our eyes. Yeah, I, I got to agree, Mike. Yep. So, uh... This could be fun if it actually happens. I mean, I don't know how much more road they have to kick that can down, but it's a party, let me tell you. <laughs> well, uh, 
you know, we'll, we'll see, Don. I, I don't know. We'll see. They've been playing this game for quite quite some time, and I, I don't see them just willingly walking away from it. I mean, that's a it's a huge freaking casino. And uh, they got marked cards. They, they, they've, they've got rigged dice. <laughs> they, they don't want to walk away from that casino. Let me tell you. <laughs> All right. Now, whether you have kids or maybe you know kids, maybe you got grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever. Have you ever talked to them about what they might want to do with their life once they grow up? Have you ever asked them, ever, what did you want to do with your life when you grew up? Did you have a, a thought in, in your mind that I want to be this or that? I want to learn about this. I, 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 something may be useful. Something may be useful to the world to yourself, uh, productive. From summitnews.com, or summit.news, I should say, not .com, uh, on July 19th, number one career choice for American kids is to be YouTubers. That's right. The number one career choice for American kids is to be YouTubers. <laughs> For Chinese kids, it's an astronaut. <laughs> A new study by Harris found that the number one choice, uh, career choice for American kids is to become a YouTuber. Uh, participants were asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? 29% of American kids said they want to become a YouTuber, while 30% of children in the UK said the same thing. However, in China, 56% wanted to become astronauts, while only 18% wanted to become a YouTuber. Yeah, well, sock uh, growing is, is never easy. <laughs> the reality is that just like kids who aspire to be rappers while anyone can technically be a youtuber the chances of a success are minimal while no one is comparing making videos to working on an oil rig the sheer workload it takes to establish a platform on youtube is monumental some would argue that wanting to become an astronaut is even more optimistic but at least the chinese kids are striving towards something Maybe a little more worthwhile. The results indicate that Western societies are fundamentally broken in that being a YouTuber is so coveted, while Chinese kids are mm, more cerebrally aspirational in their goals. <laughs> I want to be a YouTuber. <laughs> Oh my God. I'm glad I don't have children. <laughs> you know? <laughs> mm. I am just glad I do not have children. Uh, be horrible if that's what your kid was looking to be. <laughs> All right, Linux users, Linux users. We've been free from viruses and malware for our entire existence as Linux users. I don't know if you had it or not, Sock. Maybe, maybe it's in there twice. All right. Evil Gnomes. Linux malware record uh, record activities and spy on users. Yep, evil, the Evil Gnome's Linux malware has been linked to the infamous Russian threat actors from the Gamaradan group. The IT security researchers at Intazar Labs have discovered a sophisticated new backdoor, Linux malware in the wild that has been developed to target Linux devices. Dubbed Evil Gnomes by researchers, the malware was found masquerading as a GNOME shelf extension targeting Linux desktop users. 
it's worth noting that the researchers spotted the malware after its authors directly uploaded its latest test version uh, on VirusTotal, where none of the antivirus software detected any suspicious activity. According to Intizar Lab's blog post, along with backdoor capabilities, Evil Gnome's malware is also equipped with key logging. It snaps desktop screenshots on a targeted device, steals files, records conversations through the victim's microphone, and drop additional Linux malware on the system. It is believed that Evil Gnomes is associated with the Russian threat actors from the Gamma Rodin group, who have been active since 2013, especially against the Ukrainian government. The Gamma Rodin group uses spear phishing campaigns to target its victims, uh, its victims, while its payloads are hosted and distributed from different Russian hosting companies. Uh, Evil Gnomes also uses the same hosting company that has been used by the Gamma Rodin group for years. Intizar Labs further noted that the server used by the Gamma Rodin group had SSH over port 3436, which happens to be the same used by Evil Gnome. And probably lots of other people, but, you know, whatever. Uh, the analysis further shows, shows that this Linux implant is delivered in the form of a self-extracting shell script created with MakeSelf, a small shell script that generates a self-extractable uh, compressed tar archive from a directory. The setup script installs the malware too, and you can easily check this on your system, uh, root or uh, home, the slash dot cache slash gnome dash software slash gnome dash shell dash extensions to disguise as a gnome shell extension. Additionally, to gain persistence, gnome dash shell dot extension dot sh is registered to run every minute in cron tab. Ain't that just fun? Uh, Intizer <laughs> Labs identified five modules in the Evil Gnome backdoor implant. Shooter Audio, which records audio from the victim's microphone and uploads it to C2. Shooter Image, this module takes screenshots of your desktop and uploads them to C2. Shooter File, this module looks for files on the system and uploads them to C2. Shooter Ping, this module receives new commands from C2. And Shooter Key, this module has been used by malware authors as of now. Evil Gnome is a rare type of Linux malware due to its appetite for Linux de desktop users. We anticipate newer versions to be discovered and reviewed in the future, which could potentially shed more light into the group's operations, said researchers. Although Linux is a secure operating system, Lately, cyber criminals have been successfully targeting Linux-based devices. For instance, earlier this year, a cryptocurrency malware called Speak Up was found infecting Mac and Linux devices. Last year, Linux users were hit by uh, nasty Xbash malware equipped with disk wiping, ransomware, and crypto jacking capabilities. Therefore, no matter which operating system you are on, chances are that hackers can find their way to infiltrate and steal your data. To protect yourself from such, a, such attacks, uh, learn about the ongoing threats, especially spear phishing attacks. Also, keep your system up to date and regularly scan it with a reliable, and they have a link here to uh, the top 10 best antiviruses softwares for 2019, which I shared with you last week. So, and Komodo, Komodo works very nice uh, on, on Linux systems, on most of your Linux systems. It's kind of a bitch to go real time on that, but uh, it, it you can do it with a little bit of work. <laughs> on Mint anyway, it's probably different on other systems. Uh, but but some of the, some of the there's, there's got to, it's got a few quirks to get it up and running in Mint, and every time you update it, you got to go through that little process once again. But uh, Komodo runs nice. Uh, that's C-O-M-O-D-O. -O. 
So, and it's free. Again. So, uh, just bear that in mind. Just because you're on Linux don't mean you're absolutely freaking safe. Uh, as you ought to be, as you think you were. <laughs> now, I know there's some Chrome users out there. I mean, straight Chrome. Direct Chrome browsers. Browser users. I personally don't like Chrome. Never did. Uh, but I do use Brave, which is a Chrome derivative. Uh, Chromium derivative, I should say. Chromium being a more open version of Chrome, <laughs> which uh, kind of lends itself. It is implemented automatically on certain Linux operating systems. Uh, but Chrome, which is used widely, probably the most widely used browser out there at this point in time. I haven't checked the stats on that in a while to see which browser was being the most widely used, but I'm going to bet it's Chrome right now that's being used out there. Anyway, Chrome 76, this was released on nakedsecurity.sophos.com uh, on, on the 22nd of July. Chrome 76 blocks websites from detecting incognito mode. So that's a good thing. That, that's a bonus. That's a positive. Have you ever bypassed a website paywall using the browser's privacy mode? If not, you might want to try it. Uh, yeah, I, I usually do it, just can do it through cookie blocking, but that, you know, you can, you can do it with privacy mode as well. Um, anyway, it used to be a simple hack to read an article without registering, paying, or logging into the publisher's website, but per subscription-based websites caught on. Now, for example, visit any article on the Washington Post, which I don't recommend going to the Washington Post ever for anything, whatever, but that's what they're saying here. Visit their news, news site. They're calling them a news site, which, again, I would tend to disagree with. While in Google Chrome's incognito mode, and you'll get the following message. We noticed you're browsing in private mode. Private browsing is permitted exclusively... For our subscribers, turn off private browsing to keep reading this story or subscribe to use this free feature uh, plus to get unlimited digital access. This is annoying, not because it means that the visitor can't access the story. The publisher is, of course, within its rights, but because it seems to be impossible or uh, imposing uh, restrictions on the whole idea of private browsing. If it's up to publishers to decide when a visitor is allowed to remain private, then that, is that mode really private? Eh, it's never, it was never really private to begin with, but that's another story. <laughs> so plans to remedy the loophole. As was reported on this website earlier this year, Google agrees and has laid out its plans to remedy the loophole websites have been using to detect visitors in Chrome's incognito mode. The loophole in question is Chrome's file system API, which is de disengaged in incognito mode to keep people's browsing uh, activity private. Eventually, websites twigged uh, that, that receiving an error message when checking whether it, this was, an acce was accessible was a simple gateway that visitors had gone incognito. This doesn't matter to sites that have hard paywalls because a login is required regardless of browsing mode. The issue arises on sites that try to whet your appetite, a little clickbait stuff going on there, by offering two or three free articles, which means they need to plug ways of beating this limit. According to Google, starting with Chrome version 76 on the 30th of July, this means that should be out by now, uh, publishers will no longer be able to detect incognito mode by checking the file system API. They may find another way, but that method is no longer going to work for them. And just in case publishers look for other methods, the file system API being far from the only giveaway, Google warns, Chrome will likewise work to remedy any other current or future means of incognito mode detection. The company's advice to publishers is to adjust their settings to allow more or fewer free articles or to ask users to log in 
something that's likely to have a paywall site, site owners muttering under their breath. And it goes on here to talk about the illusion of privacy and private browsing doesn't hide your your visits to porn sites. <laughs> oh, various other things, but uh, bear, it, it's a good it's a good thing regardless. It's good for them to be doing, uh, making that kind of a move. Um, I personally, like I said, I just block cookies for sites that I want to visit. Uh, more than three times or whatever the hell they let you. Like Bloomberg. Uh, I, I, I go to the Bloomberg site because I find uh, links there on the Twitter. And I click it and they'll say, oh, you're down to your last view or you've you've used up all your views for this month. So I just went in and blocked cookies and it always says I got nine more articles remaining. And I've done that on some other sites as well. So yeah, you just block cookies for the site and you don't have to worry about being in, in incognito mode, which a lot of times you don't want to be in incognito mode for your browser uh, because you have logins and such that that will not you will you will not be logged in under uh, on those specific sites if you are in incognito mode. So yeah, it's something to think about. All right, you dirty, filthy European bastards! What the hell are you up to over there? <laughs> Europe faces looming syphilis epidemic as hookup apps go viral. Yes, the rise of dating apps and the falling rates of HIV in the developed world have led to the reemergence of an STD that was, until recently, confined to the literary novels from the 19th century. <coughs> Excuse me. The spread of syphilis in Europe is intensifying, said Andro Amato Gauchi, the head of the HIV AIDS Sexually Transmitted Infections and Viral Hepatitis Program. Oh, what a horrible program to be in charge of. At the European Center for Disease Prevention. Uh, uh, and control the ECDC. He told RT that uh, various factors play into the outbreak, such as people having sex without condoms, multiple sexual partners, and a reduce, reduced fear of acquiring HIV from condomless sex. A new report by the ECDC shows that the number of confirmed cases of syphilis across the EU soared by 70% between 2010 and 2017. The biggest innovation in the dating world during that period is the rise of the hookup apps like Tinder, Grindr, and Bumble, aka bringing the sharing economy to the dating world. Rates of HIV slash AIDS deaths have been declining across the world after peaking in the early 2000s. And they have a graph here showing you that drop-off. Oddly enough, the leader in Europe, in, in Iceland, a country where 300,000 inhabitants are all, at the very least, distant cousins, the syphilis rate in Iceland has climbed by 876%. Bunch of cousin fuckers. In Ireland... Syphilis rates have climbed 224%, while Germany and Britain have seen rates double. Oh, man, I tell you. <laughs> According to the ECDC, homosexual acts, specifically men having sex with men, is responsible for two-thirds of the cases reported between or 2007 and 2017. Heterosexual men constitute 23% of the cases, and women 15. Uh, Amato Gauchi said growing rates of unprotected sex is only part of the problem. Lack of testing and sex education are also issues. Gauchi had a few ideas for policies that could lower rates. These include more testing for syphilis in some groups, such as men who have sex with men, lack of in insufficient lack of or insufficient sex education 
poor access to condoms for teenagers and young adults, sex under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Really, how does that affect it? Uh, including the use of uh, psychoactive uh, party drugs. Party drugs! <laughs> About how Gauchi said dating apps may facilitate more sexual encounters and with the transmission of STI, sexually transmitted infections, like syphilis. Lorenzo Gauchi, associated per, uh, associate professor of the Departments of Medicine and Global Health at the University of Washington, uh, said a robust response will be needed to lower syphilis rates. The ECDC data clearly shows that syphilis is not a disease of the past, but very present among us. There is no vaccine for syphilis. And while penicillin, penicillin can cure syphilis in its early stages, once it becomes late, can, becomes late stage, too bad, so sad, you gonna die. <laughs> you filthy, disease-ridden Europeans. Icelandian cousin fuckers. <laughs> All right. I, I don't even what, know what to make of this next story. But here it is. It was posted on July 22nd on themindunleashed.com by Elias Merritt. And, and, and I'm thinking Godzilla. I am thinking absolutely we got a Godzilla coming. Anytime now. Any day now. Godzilla is going to be stomping down some city. Once endangered crocodiles are now thriving outside of a nuclear power plant. If we're to believe the headlines, there's a whole croc of crazy alligator-related madness brewing in the southern U.S. <laughs> Earlier this month, police in Tennessee issued a tongue-in-cheek warning about the dangers of the so-called meth gators, tweaker alligators, spawned by methamphetamine dealers flushing their stashes down the toilet during drug raids. Now, the so Associated Press is reporting that American crocodiles who once faced extinction are now thriving in an unlikely place the canals that surround a nuclear power plant in South Florida. With Godzilla 2 and the new horror film Crawl, both near the top of the box office charts over the past couple of months, it would be nice to entertain the thought of a nuclear-enhanced mutant reptile stalking the land. But, alas, southern Florida's multitude of crocodiles are neither monstrous nor radioactive. Last week, yet, yet, let me add the words on there, yet. <laughs> Last week, 73 hatchlings belonging to the American crocodile or crocodilus act, acutus species were discovered by specialists at Florida Power and Light, Turkey Point Nuclear Plant and the researchers expect dozens more, dozens more, in the coming days. What makes this discovery remarkable is that crocodiles, which were believed headed towards extinction, have been in such a swift state of recovery that their federal status was boosted in 27, or 2007 from endangered to threatened. As it turns out, Turkey Point's 168-mile complex of man-made canals that cool the nuclear power plant also comprise a thriving habit for the species. Hundreds of American crocodiles. Hundreds. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Um, they, they say no Godzilla. I'm saying, come on, we, 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 we all need a little Godzilla in our lives. And, uh, you know, an American, an American Godzilla would be terrific. It would be huge. <laughs> it would be uh, uh, Trumpzilla. Trumpzilla. <laughs> oh, man. 
All right. Vinny, you claim to be a journalist out there in the world, a journalist for Real Liberty Media. There are probably others that claim to be journalists that are here hanging out. And there are many other people that are journalists or claim to be journalists in various areas throughout the U.S. of A. Zero Hedge, July 22nd, 2019, Tyler Durden. Actually, it's uh, Max Slavo from shtfplan.com, but it's posted over here on Zero Hedge under Tyler Durden's moniker. CIA wants to make it easier to jail journalists, and Congress says, meh, what do we care? What do we care about that Constitution, that First Amendment? It makes no difference to us. <laughs> Free speech has been on the chopping block for a long time. Journalists are already silenced and have to ask government for permission before running stories, while alternative media is censored and blocked by Google search algorithms. But now it's getting worse, and Congress says, too bad, so sad. We don't care. The CIA wants to make it a whole lot easier to throw journalists in jail if they say or write the wrong things, if they're experiencing wrong think. According to Tech Dirty, the CIA is pushing for an expansion of a 37-year-old law that would deter journalists from covering national security issues or reporting on leaked documents such as those Julian Assange posted to WikiLeaks and is rotting in a jail cell for. Yeah, thanks to a dissolution CIA case, uh, thanks to a dissolution case, CIA case officer's actions in 1975, there are currently a few limits, or only a few limits, or very few limits, or no limits, to what can or can't be reported about covert operatives working overseas. Yep, the CIA wants all of these protections for journalists removed, including the word overseas. <laughs> okay. This would allow the CIA and all other intelligence agencies to designate whoever they want as protected by the IIPA in perpetuity and jail those who report about things the government wants to keep from your prying eyes. Democrats, I'm not, I don't care if I'm going to read about that. No administration should have the power to prevent journalists from publishing illegal acts undertaken by the government. Ever. For any reason. So why are you bringing up Democrats? <laughs> oh God. So yeah, they want to lock you in jail there, Vinny. I'm sure the Bundys are a uh, national security threat. This one posted a month ago, so you probably all heard about it by now. Um, uh, over here on uh, truepundit.com. FBI rocked. <laughs> really? Rocked? Were they? Uh, I, I, it's been a month, and I, I don't recall a whole lot of rocking going on. But anyway, anyway, that's the headline. FBI rocked by public suicide of top FBI agent who investigated the Clinton Foundation. Oh, he investigated the Clintons and then committed suicide. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> little Arkansas going on. FBI agents are mourning the death of one of the Bureau's top financial crime supervisors who reportedly shot and killed himself on a crowded nightclub dance floor. <laughs> According to the FBI top insiders, Salvatore Sal Cincinnati, uh, a former Wall Street broker who joined the FBI in 2010, died last week during a night out after an FBI training session, sources said. Cincinnati was 
was one a super one one I think once a supervisory special agent who spearheaded many of the FBI's high profile and complex Wall Street investigations, including probing the finances of the Clinton Foundation. After leaving his Wall Street career, Cincinnati was first assigned to the New York field office and later promoted to HQ in Washington, D.C. when uh, he was a native New Yorker as well. Very, very bright guy, said FBI insider. Such a young guy, it really gets you in the gut. He put he put in the hours. He was always working hard. Cincinnati was 41. Cincinnati was reportedly out partying with the FBI colleagues at the Container Bar, a trendy watering hole in Austin, Texas. The group had been drinking and dancing, according to sources. Later in the evening, Cincinnati reportedly turned the gun on himself on a crowded dance floor. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure he did. Uh, bar owner Bridget Dunlap did not respond to phone calls seeking details on the incident. FBI agents on site and police instructed witnesses to delete any videos or photographs of the event and cleared out the bar, which is why you have seen no videos or photographs of him shooting himself in the middle of a crowded bar. According to reports, Likely, or likewise, the FBI officials... Quit moving around on me here. <laughs> uh, FBI officials instructed Austin police to not release any details of the death to the media. Witnesses at the nightclub were also told to stay offline and keep quiet about the shooting. The FBI has not commented on Cincinnati's death. According to his re resume, Cincinnati was a supervisory special agent in the FBI's Complex Financial Crimes Unit. He managed the FBI's financial crimes program for the Northeast region. Northeast region? What the hell is he doing in Austin? Uh, and was a, a detailee from the FBI Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Anyway, whatever. Uh, it's 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 the same old story, same old song and dance, once again. <laughs> Just a little Arkansas for the masses. All right, and finally, for today, we come to this article on the New York Post dot com. Now, as most of you are aware. On September 20th, there was a thing scheduled, planned, set up over on Facebook to get people to storm Area 51. Well, uh, bunches and bunches of people signed up, like a million people signed up to storm Area 51. Not that any of them were really going to go, and it was obviously a joke thing to do that, to get a million people to storm Area 51. So that, that wasn't going to happen. Then there was Woodstock, Woodstock 50, which was supposed to happen this year. But due to certain conditions and artists' situations and whatever, Woodstock 50 didn't happen. So some geniuses, and I think I talked about this like last week, came up with the idea of combining the two events and make it alien stock out there uh, in the, the, the little town just outside of Area 51. Alien stock. Be that as it may. Now, according to the New York Post on July 23rd by Chris Siasi, now the Internet wants to storm Loch Ness. <laughs> First they came for the aliens. Then they came for the Bermuda Triangle. Now they're coming for Nessie. And following the footsteps of Storm Area 51 and Storm the Bermuda Triangle uh, events, a Facebook group has been created in an attempt to find the legendary creature known as Nessie. More than 21,000 people have signed up for Storm Loch Ness, an event created by Brian Richards. 
An additional 43,000 people have replied as interested in the event. News of the event was first reported by the BBC. Uh, the news outlet said that they, uh, that Volunteer Royal National Lifeboat Institution, which monitors Loch Ness, does not have the resources to handle a mass of people if they all show up. Now, I don't know how much it costs to get to Loch Ness from wherever you may be, unless you're living in Loch Ness in Scotland there. But I think it's going to cost most Americans, the crazy ones, to get there than it would to get to Area 51. <laughs> and getting to the Bermuda Triangle, well, uh, that's just nuts. <laughs> Anyway, with no U.S. Army involved, Loch Ness looks a little less hazardous than storming Area 51. But here we have our own set of problems, uh, the spokesman told the BBC. Our Atlantic 85 lifeboat has an impressive survivor carrying capacity, but even that will be stretched by the attendees of this event. Nobody's going. <laughs> don't, don't you worry about it, boys. <laughs> Leave Nessie alone. Let Nessie be. Who'd she ever bother? She hides. She don't even want to know that you just keep on picking on her. All right, folks. That's going to wrap it up for here on Grim Leftovers for another week. Episode 36 in the can. Yes, indeed. Thank you all so much for tuning in and playing along, being part of the show, being part of Real Liberty Media. It's always, it's always highly appreciated to have you here with us have you here with me i say us but i'm just me well i got a lot of voices in my head i don't know do those count all right anyway i'll be back again next week with episode 37 uh the, tomorrow i don't know what time flash is coming on with the show uh in a perfect world he's been doing it he was scheduled to do it 2 a.m but he's been doing it more like 1 p.m so uh, maybe that's the, you know back back to the old time back to the future so just pay attention uh, to the, what's going on. The RLM Twitter there, barmans underscore RLM uh, uh, Twitter account for, for when things are coming up and coming on. That, that's really the best way to, to monitor what's happening. So uh, check that. And then Grammy, her last two shows, Wednesday and Friday, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Eastern, Grammy's Rocket Chair. She will be missed greatly, but uh, definitely tune in to those two. And check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all of the rest of the awesome shows here on Real Liberty Media. Have yourselves a great night. Talk to you later. Peace.